Welcome. This is Richard Stanford from the Rajavian Committee. Uh, we've had three great programs already this summer. We've had Ali Master with his story of what a successful immigrant can be in this country and all the opportunities of this country. Uh, we've had Nancy Ashley with the, the Palmers of Glen Irie, great story of the Colorado Springs area, a, a famous family and a wonderful mansion. Uh, and we've had Tracy Walder with her personal story that is so compelling. Uh, it's, been, it's been a great summer so far, and today we're going to have uh, Dana Harkey. Dana is one of our favorite reviewers, and it's particularly appropriate uh, to have Dana at this point because she's going to do D-Day Girls. Uh, this is the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, and how appropriate it is to talk about a, to talk about a topic that involves the war at this time. So get ready, have fun, uh, let me introduce Dana Harkey. I'm Richard Stanford of the Rajavian Committee. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dana Harkey is, is a, a product of SMU. She got her undergraduate degree and her master's degree at SMU. Uh, she's a great reviewer. She loves to read and she loves to tell good stories. Uh, now, uh, today she's going to do uh, D-Day Girl, Sarah Rose. How appropriate for the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Uh, Dana has been really active in the community. Uh, she's a member of Highland Park United Methodist Church. Uh, she does Meals on Wheels. She's in the Scruggs and the, and the Designers and Diggers Garden Club. Uh, she deals with uh, uh, all kinds of uh, intellectual exercise. She's part of the Mary Craig class. Uh, she's also a part of the Dallas Women's Club and, and has, works at Wesley Rankin as a volunteer. So she's out and about in all kinds of ways helping her community. She's married to Jackson Harkey. They have two adult children and three grandchildren they dote on. Uh, so uh, again, we are pleased to welcome uh, Dana Harkey with D-Day Girls by Sarah Rose. I want to start by saying thank you to the Rejabian family Richard Stanford and Highland Park United Methodist Church for allowing this wonderful series that's been going on for lo these many years to continue this summer in a different kind of atmosphere. So I'm very happy to be here and I want to tell you all the story of D-Day Girls tonight. It was the early years, some of the early nights of the Blitz in London. The battle for Britain had begun. Sir Maxwell Knight was sitting in his office behind drawn blackout curtains and he was musing on the topic, would it be suitable to use women as spies? Sir Richard, you see, worked for MI6. It is said that Ian Fleming used him as the model for James Bond's boss, M. And he was just the right kind of man to be working at MI6, very James Bondish type, handsome, he'd been to the right schools. He, uh, can't you just see him if he'd been out of his country house, he drove into town in his Range Rover. If he was in his townhouse, he came in his black Jaguar. Uh, so that was the kind of guy he was, but he was musing, could we use women as spies? Is there any, any value in that? Uh, up to this point, intelligence was an all-male domain, very clubby. The men were all went to school at Oxford and took their degrees at Oxford and uh, went to school at Eton uh, for their undergraduate uh, years, their elementary school years. But his memo, he really did, this is a true story, he really did write this memo on the subject of sex in connection with using women as agents. He said, one thing that women could do was to seduce men to extract information, but not just any woman would do. One that was markedly oversexed or undersexed would not do at all. So there you have it. Women were like porridge, neither too hot nor too cold. Uh, if undersexed, Sir Maxwell said, she would lack the charisma needed to seduce her target. If she was oversexed, she would scare her boss to death. What is decidedly needed is a clever woman who can use her personal attractions wisely, Sir Maxwell finally said. And so there you have it. Intelligence officers had long presumed that women's special ac uh, assets to be used in the spy business were limited to strategically de deploying their batting eyelashes, soliciting pillow talk, and of course maining files and doing type work, typing work. Overseeing operations, not so much. 
Historically, women had counted on their feminine charms when they were trying to uh, practice espionage, mostly because that was the only weapon available to them. The aggression, vision, and executive capacity to run a spy network were not considered to be within a female uh, skill set. And yet, even as Ma uh, Sir Maxwell's memo was circulating through MI6, that the right kind of woman might come in handy during this time of war, the spy masters were realizing that World War II was going to be different. It was going to be a total war. It was going to take all the men they had fighting on the ground, and new opportunities might be open for women. In the United States, Wild Bill Hickok, the new director of the Operation, of, uh, or Operation for Strategic Services, had already begun uh, recruiting some women. Mostly they were blue-blooded women that had gone to blue stocking schools, highly educated. Among them was one you probably know. She was a tall, gangling girl from California, had been to boarding schools and Smith College. Her name was Julia McWilliams. And she started as a typist in the typing pool, but because of her education, she was eventually moved up and she ended up well, Bill, Bill Donovan's assistant uh, in charge of maintaining the files for over 10,000 agents that the OSS was running at the time. She eventually went to Ceylon and then to, uh, into China where she met the man who would become her husband, Paul Child. That's right, it was Julia Child, worked for the OSS at the beginning of World War II. But most OSS women were, high, were consigned to the typing pool or used as clerks. Uh, Donovan himself called it the apron strings of the organization. And those who went above and beyond really got little recognition. Donovan's executive assistant, her, his secretary herself, Eloise Page, helped plan all the details of Operation Torch, which was the invasion of North Africa. And she was never recognized for her work until recently when memos were unsealed. Well, Europe presented even more opportunities for women. Uh, the spy agencies were, expect were really growing to cope with the need for covert action on the ground in Europe. Uh, and those were insurrections that had to be plotted underneath the very noses of German occupiers. The French resistance called on women's courage. Do you remember the book that was real popular a couple of years ago uh, by Kristen Hanna called The Nightingale? It was two sisters and one had to stay home and actually had to house Nazi officers. Now this is all fiction, but it was rang true because one of the sisters was working for uh, the French resistance as a spy. And the two sisters resented each other and what they were doing. There's another very good book that I wanted to recommend if you want to read historical fiction about this era. Uh, and it's by Leela Meacham, who was one of our authors at Authors Live here last year. And that book is called Dragonfly. And it was uh, very well written. And she said it was very interesting to write because it involved five main characters, which for her was very unusual. So that's another historical fiction book that you might uh, want to read. Back to facts, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of England the very day Germany invaded Belgium and the Netherlands, the Low Countries, the very day. And yet people were a little concerned, feeling that Winston did not have the leadership capabilities. But Winston went into office knowing exactly what needed to be done. Among the agencies that he began, he called the Special Operations Executive. Uh, it was called in-house the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, and their charge was to set Europe ablaze. And ungentlemanly is really too pretty a word to put with this. Winston had in mind recruiting assets on the ground who would do things like uh, blow up bridges, sabotage railroads, uh, and they, these people would be outside the protection of their governments, they would be outside the protection of the courts, or any other global political conventions. This was warfare by any means available. There would be kidnappings, murders, demolitions, explosions, ransoms, and torture. And that's what I found in the book D-Day Girls by Sarah Rose. And I chose to title this uh, topic tonight D-Day Girls because this book covered all the uh, 
the whole situation there. But I'm going to talk about three specific women, all of each had books written about them. So I read quite a few books getting ready for this story, and I hope you'll find it interesting. The uh, blurb on the front cover of D-Day Girls was written by Eric Larson, who you might remember as the author of Devil in the White City and In the Garden of the Beast, which was pre-World War II Germany, and currently uh, The Splendid and the Vile, which is about uh, Winston Churchill's family. And his blurb said, this is a gripping book. Spies, romance, Gestapo thugs, blown up trains, courage and treachery, lots of treachery, and all of it is true. And so that's why I really had, uh, would recommend this book, first of all. So you see, you have the British are fighting in North Africa and at sea. They'd already been evacuated from Dunkirk. The RAF is fighting a gallant battle against uh, uh, the uh, uh, Blitzkrieg, uh, the bombing of, nightly bombing of London. And Churchill starts training these SOE, Special Operation Executive or the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. He starts training people and he realizes that women are going to be very valuable because men are in short supply. They are either at war or they're in prison uh, as most of the French soldiers were. Uh, French captured soldiers were already imprisoned and made to work in German war factories. Um, and so he began to recruit women to do this. Uh, to do these jobs and they would be, they would go to France and recruit agents, establish networks, receive clandestine shipments, set up safe houses, manage communications, and sniff out tra traitors. And women turned out to be very good at this. So the plan was, everyone knew, eventually, if they were to win this war, the Allies would have to launch an assault upon the continent. And what, what they hoped would happen, there would be trained people there on the ground ready to assist, to create diversions when the, when the uh, actual invasion happened. Uh, even before the invasion was planned, it had a name, D-Day. Now Churchill says in his gruffest voice to the minister in charge of the dark agency for secret warriors, mostly women, now, he says, now set Europe ablaze. So let's talk about a few of these women. The first one I want to tell you about is Marie Madeleine Fourcade. And the book is Madeleine, Madame Fourcade's War. Now, Madame Fourcade was married, but her, her husband was away. She lived in, in Paris in the 1930s, where she enjoyed the liberation, the liberated feeling of Paris in the 1930s. And at parties, she was often very vocal about her disdain for the Nazi regime. This was before uh, France was occupied. She was recruited by a World War I hero, Georges Lacotte, whose, whose code name was Navarre. And she, he thought that she had just the right assets to help him run some of these spy networks that he was running for Vichy France at the time. And at first she was very reluctant. She was young. She was under 30, and she was a woman. She said, I'm just a woman. How can I do this? And he said, that's precisely it. It's because you're a woman that I want you to do it. Uh, reluctantly, she accepts, probably for love of country, but also because she, I think she wanted this taste of adventure. Um, when she uh, was introduced to some of the other uh, people in the inner circle as her code name, they said, good God, she's a woman. How can she do that? But she soon made, uh, overruled any skepticism that anyone had about her. Um, Navarre himself was captured in Algiers in 1941. And he left the running of the whole network to Madame Fourcade. Uh, that network was called Alliance. It was backed by MI6, the British spy agency. They were funding it financially. And uh, their main mission was to infiltrate Alliance's main mission was to infiltrate the German submarine bases along the coast. Uh, it became very important because they ultimately recruited the head of the shipyard to provide drawings and other crucial things, and they had agents in all the uh, bars and, and uh, coastline areas listening to the chatter among the uh, German submariners, uh, the bar bartenders, the prostitutes that were there. And then Forcott's network took that information and passed it along to the British. One way they did it was they would have, the British would fly in flights at night, 
the British airplanes would land between the hedgerows on long fields. They would off land quickly, offload supplies, personnel, financial means, explosives within 30 seconds and take off again. And so Madame Forcade's uh, code name was Hedgehog because she helped organize some of those drop-offs. Uh, and she picked a non-generic a name uh, because she thought if anyone knew she was a woman, they wouldn't uh, take her seriously and she didn't want to endanger the lives of the other agents within her network. She eventually showed those skeptics who was boss. She pushed the Brits to alter their communication practices because uh, one way they, another way they got information out was through radios. Uh, and the Germans would drive the streets of the small towns and listen for radio signals. And when they heard one, they would invade the house and usually arrest a radio operator. And Madame Forcade got or organized a system where they would only be on for seconds at a time, and the British would know exactly when to tune in. It saved dozens of lives. Um, her network depended on that British financial support and interpretation of the um, information. Uh, but there was de Gaulle in, Fran in England. He, he, he had gotten out of France when, uh, France when Paris was overtaken by the Nazis, and he was sheltering in England, and he was not a gracious guest. Uh, so he, the British didn't want to tell him too much, so it was kind of a tricky situation, and they really depended on Madame Fourcade's information coming out of France. The information that she supplied was astounding, not only the submarine information, but uh, one of her assets was a young woman named Jeanne Rousseau. Uh, Jeanne was brilliant. She spoke five languages and by the time she was 20 she was working as a translator for the Germans and um, she hung around the Nazi officers and she listened to what they were going on and she asked questions and they thought she was just a pretty young thing and so they told her answers. They even showed her plans. They kind of mansplained things to her and uh, they even showed her plans. Well she had a photographic memory and she was able, they told her about this new weapon they were creating, the V-2 missile, and it was going to be the first ballistic missile and how wonderful German technology was. Here, let me show you, they'd say. And she took her photographic memory and she managed to get that information out to England, to the British, to the British uh, intelligence. And they uh, arranged to bomb Penny Moon Day, which is where they were, the plant where they were building these rockets. So her information ultimately saved thousands of lives. The British wanted to exfiltrate her to England for debriefing. And on her way to being, meeting the uh, British asset who would get her out, she was captured. She was sent to a concentration camp and uh, she survived remarkably defiant the whole time. Uh, Alliance was a uh, major target for the German spy catchers. Uh, Hitler had said from now on these uh, spies that we kept will not be treated as prisoners of war. They will be treated as Nacht and Nebel, night and fog. In other words, as if they had never happened. They would simply disappear. Punishment was to be a total eradication from all living memory. Among those women, among those captured were women tortured by the infamous Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon. And Forcade later remembered, she said, in my network, no woman ever faltered, even under the most extreme torture. I owed my freedom many times to many who were questioned until they lost consciousness, but they never re uh, revealed my whereabouts, even when they knew exactly where I was. Madame Forcade was eventually exfiltrated to London after being in charge for two and a half years. Most of the uh, leaders of the resistance lasted about six months before they were either exfiltrated or captured or killed. And she was there for two and a half years. After the war, Madame Fourcade's feats were dismissed because how a French resistor was remembered was uh, her associations with Vichy France. People didn't want to think about Vichy France. De Gaulle himself wanted the French Republic to be what was remembered, that it was just a brief blip that the Nazis had overtaken it. And because Forcade and Navarre were uh, associated early on with Vichy France, um, the Gaullists wanted nothing to do with her. Uh, she didn't really mind not being recognized. She took her accomplishments very modestly. She always thought it should be her agents who were uh, 
remembered, and Jean Rousseau eventually was honored by the American CIA 50 years after the war was over when some of her accomplishments were declassified. They noted that it was her reports about the V-2 missiles that allowed the Allies to disrupt the manufacture and testing of those terroristic weapons that saved thousands of lives in the West. Madame Forcade, eventually her uh, deeds were recognized uh, as befit her war efforts, and when she died in 1989 at the age of 79, she became the first woman to be given a funeral at Les Invalides, that complex in Paris that cele celebrates the military glory of, pa of France. It's where Napoleon is buried. On the morning of her funeral, her body was greeted by the Republican Guard, who came out to carry her casket inside uh, at the Cathedral of St. Louis des Invalides. Among the mourners were Jacques Chirac and Francois Mitterrand. The next woman I want to tell you about is Virginia Hall. Her book is A Woman of No Importance. It's been very popular with book clubs uh, this spring in Dallas, so some of you may have read this book and know a little bit about Virginia Hall. She was an American woman, but she was recruited by the uh, Winston Churchill's SOE, Special Operations Executive, and she became perhaps the most successful allied secret agent on the ground uh, of the war, unimpeded by her sex or by a wooden leg that she called Cuthbert. One time she was hiking over the Pyrenees, going from occupied France into uh, neutral Spain, and she radioed ahead that Cuthbert was bothering her, and her handlers radioed back, well, eliminate him. Virginia Hall herself was born in Baltimore into high society, and after her debut, she went to Europe for the general tour of Europe as, as uh, uh, a wealthy <coughs> young woman did there. And she went to Jazz Age Paris and loved it. Her father lost all his money in the Depression, and she decided she wanted to stay in Europe. And so she worked at em American embassies, usually as a desk clerk, all during that time because she wanted to stay in uh, in France. Always an outdoorsy type, she associated with the ambassadors and the rest of the staff at those embassies, and she was out snipe hunting one day when she accidentally shot her foot, and she developed sepsis and almost died, thus Cuthbert, her wooden leg. She wanted to work for the U.S. State Department, but she was always turned down, so eventually she drove an ambulance in Paris because she couldn't stand uh, doing uh, desk work anymore. She decided she needed to get out when France was occupied and after she crossed the Pyrenees she uh, was at a train station in uh, a small town in Spain where she met a man who worked for Churchill in the Ungentlemanly Warfare Division. He interviewed her and decided she was just what they needed. So she was hired by Churchill in the SOE and eventually went to a uh, she went to Lyon, where she knew nobody, posing as an American journalist, because remember, this is before Pearl Harbor even. She posed as an American journalist, and she set up spy networks all over uh, the south of France, uh, the unoccupied part of France. Uh, she was a secret li liaison officer, and she recruited women and other people to help her, and then did things that went beyond her job description, and even began collecting the information that she needed her herself. She helped down British pilots. Uh, she organized French women and, uh, to help escort those pilots to safety. She was called brusque and uh, abrupt, and her handlers were reluctant to formalize her authority as chief, so they would hire a man over her, and invariably the man would be either a womanizer or a drunk, because uh, they weren't fighting, so they were the kind of the dregs of the, what was left and she was really running the show and eventually she was recognized as that. And her professionalism opened the gate for other women to do that. And although she was hunted by the infamous Klaus Barbie, she was never captured and she always managed to get to escape. Uh, she went back to Spain where she was finally hired by the OSS and she was directing guerrilla forces from there, but she wasn't satisfied with that. She disguised herself as a milkmaid and went back into France where she sold dairy products to the German army. She listened in on many things and it developed all kinds of information that she was able to get back to the OSS. Uh, and they, she helped set up the uh, 
the uh, operations that were going to support the D-Day landing by destroying communications, organizing railroads and ambushes, and even blowing up trains. She was one of the ones who actually used the plastique to go blow up bridges and trains themselves. Uh, after the war, uh, Virginia was awarded a medal, and then she went to work by the, for the CIA. She was undervalued, and she wrote in her memoirs that the CIA was now a place where brilliant masculine minds and well-connected college kids had taken charge. And those brilliant minds called her that gung-ho lady from the war. She did eventually marry a colleague from the war, but she died in 1982, bitter and unfulfilled. As far back as 1953, Alan Dulles convened a panel, he, they called it the Petticoat Panel, to look at the contributions of women at the CIA and the attitude toward women at the agency. Uh, they ultimately concluded that compared with men, they were, the women were seen as more emotional, less objective, and insufficiently aggressive. Years later, Virginia's shoddy treatment, her mispromotions, her low pay, was cited by the CIA itself as a textbook example of discrimination. I have one more special woman I want to tell you about. Her name is Odette Sansom, and her book is Codename Lease. Uh, it was actually the first book I read, and it intrigued me and really made me want to know more about this. Uh, it was, she was a remarkable woman, Odette Sanson. She was born in France, so she's a native French woman and was a native French speaker. She, uh, her father was killed in World War I. Her family, therefore, spent every Sunday she can remember growing up at the military cemetery honoring World War I vets and those who had died. She married a British man who had been a soldier in World War I and moved to East Anglia, the part of Britain that's uh, the eastern part, kind of a marshy lowland. It was not a happy marriage. They did have three children, three little girls, but the husband was off uh, by this time, by the late 30s, was off uh, soldiering again, and so he was not at home. She saw an ad in the paper for vacation pictures of the coast of France. She and her family had often vacationed in, the co uh, in that area, and so she sent them, uh, not knowing to whom they were going or why they were wanting. Well, of course, they were sent to uh, MI6 offices where they were using them to plan the, the Allied invasion of the continent, D-Day. They were looking at pictures, looking at pictures of cliffs, looking at beaches, trying to see what the coastline could look at would look like uh, in, in the event of an uh, invasion. Uh, someone looked at her pictures and she wrote a letter that accompanied them and that said, I would be very happy to be of service. I'm a native French woman, so I speak French fluently, and I'm yet I am loyal to Britain, my adopted home. Selwyn Jepson who was in charge of the part of MI6 that was helping to plan the uh, secret part of the invasion, read the letter and asked her to come to London. She thought she was coming to pick up her pictures. He interviews her and asks her, and she goes through a series of tests and asks her if she would be willing to go back to France and help organize and be a courier for some of the spy networks there in France. She had to think about it. She had three young daughters. And yet, the call to duty was so strong, she ultimately said, yes, she would do that. She put her daughters in a convent and went to northern England in the depths of winter for training. Among the things uh, they had to do for training, they were planning to parachute these women in. And so she had to learn to be a parachute, uh, to how to parachute. Uh, she was training, doing the same training as the men that they were going to send. And they always made the women jump first uh, from the tower where they were training and then from the planes because they thought if, a, they, if the men saw a woman doing it, they would not dare to refuse. And Odette was always one of the first ones to volunteer to jump from the airplane. She became quite an accomplished parachutist. Uh, the... Uh, she was very beautiful. There were other women being trained at the time, 
and they became close friends and yet they could not exchange any information at all, such as their real names, only their code names, any family information. Everything had to be extremely classified. So the other women, women who were training with her, uh, she sometimes saw in France eventually and uh, was surprised, not surprised to see them, but uh, glad to see them. And yet they couldn't divulge where they had, seen, where they had met each other before. Uh, Every time Odette was codenamed Lise was supposed to get into France, be sent to France, it would be a dark night. Three months went by without a full moon where she could parachute into France or she could be dropped in on one of those hedgerow flights. So finally she was put on a boat in Portugal and sent around the coasts of Spain and unloaded off that boat into Marseille, which is part of Vichy, France. Uh, that was how she finally got into France. She was going to be used as a courier for a spy network that was based out of Marseille. The head of that spy network was a man named Peter Churchill, no relation to Winston. He became her handler. The uh, first night they met, he described her duties and what she was going to have to be doing. And she agreed, and the, so they were going to—they were getting off on the right foot. And the next morning, when she reported, he said, "You are to take this bicycle and go to this nearby village, ten miles away, and deliver this information to a particular house." She agreed. She went to get on the bicycle, started off, and immediately fell off. She forgot to mention that she'd never ridden a bike before. She got to, jumped up, got on the bike again, fell off again. After about 10 tries, she realized she had a ride and she took off. Peter Churchill looked out the window, saw that, and said, I fell in love with her at that moment. They developed a very strong spy network in the south of France. Uh, they, had, they were running over 100 different spies, and Odette, codenamed Lise, was right there with Peter, working with him, managing the network and also work doing her job as a courier. There was a list of names that was supposed never to be, it would be written down at first and then immediately destroyed once the codes had been memorized by the people that needed to. There was one list that got out. It was in an attache case that a courier was taking to another town. He was on a train. The attache case was at his feet. He went to sleep, and when he woke up, the attaché case was gone. So the network had been compromised. Peter Churchill had been in England being briefed, debriefed. He was due to come in on one of those hedgehog, hedgehog row flights that night. Odette was going to be so glad to see him that she wore a warm tweed suit and her last pair of nylons to go meet the plane. As the plane landed, car lights came on all across the field. They had been compromised. Odette and Peter grabbed hands and ran through the marsh. Uh, her hose were in tatters by this time. Her clothes were soaking wet, dragging her down. But with Peter, they trudged on till they got to the road. They hadn't been at the road long when they were captured. They were placed in the same car, the back seat of this same car, so they had a few moments to hold hands and trade some information. Odette said, let's say that we are married and they might keep us together. They didn't, but Peter, she told them that they were married and Peter was Winston Churchill's nephew and he might be of value to trade. So Peter was sent to Italy to an Italian prison where hopefully he would be traded eventually. Odette was sent to Paris, to the infamous prisons of Paris. At first she was interviewed by the Abwehr, which was the military, in, uh, the military intelligence uh, wing of the German army. And she, she gave up little if any information uh, while she was doing that. Eventually she was turned over to the Gestapo and there she was tortured terribly, and she, yet she never gave up any information. Uh, she used her 
uh, nylons that had been ripped to shreds in her flight to do her hair. Do you remember how people used to use the rag rollers? And she would roll up her hair in rags because she wanted to look nice, even in the midst of having her toenails pulled out. And uh, she always wanted to look nice. She was sentenced to death twice uh, at the same time. And she said, oh, well, they can't kill me twice. Uh, both times she, uh, she was uh, asked to be interviewed again where they burned her with cigarettes. And so yet she never told anything. She would give them just enough to think she might have some value. And uh, she was not uh, sentenced to death. She was not killed. Either of her death sentences were carried out. She was eventually sent to Ravensbrück, a, uh, a, a concentration camp where she contracted TB. On the uh, day before the camp was liberated, the commandant of the camp went and got Odette, and who had been who had been maintaining the story all along that she was married to Winston Churchill's nephew, put her in his car and drove toward the Allied lines. When he was captured, he said, look, I have a prisoner for you. I am going to trade this prisoner for my freedom. And Odette said, don't listen to him. He treated me horribly and, he, and he's the commandant of this camp. He was arrested and the Allies took her into their tent and said, "Would you, you can sleep here tonight. She said, I'd rather sleep outside my first night of freedom. And she slept that night under the stars. She was eventually taken back and returned to England, uh, where she married Peter Churchill. She divorced her husband and married Peter Churchill. After nine years, they divorced, and one can't help but wonder if it was post-traumatic stress that caused their marriage not to be blissfully happy. Odette, I wanted you to see a picture of her because she was so very attractive. She was awarded the George's Cross, the, uh, Britain's highest uh, military honor. And the commendation was read by King George of England. He read, Mrs. Sanson was infiltrated into enemy-occupied France and worked with great courage and distinction until April 1943, when she was arrested along with her commanding officer, Peter Churchill. For mutual protection, they agreed to maintain that they were married. She adhered to that story and even succeeded in convincing her captors, in spite of considerable contrary evidence, and through 14 interrogations with torture. She also drew Gestapo t attention off her commanding officer and onto herself by saying he was completely innocent and had only come to France at her insistence. She displayed courage, endurance, and self-sacrifice of the highest order. The king pinned a George's Cross medal on her uniform and said, I have asked that you should lead the procession, madam, as no woman has ever done before now. Odette backed three spaces, curtsied, and led the procession from the room. She was the Diana of her day in, Paris, in England. There was a movie made of her life. A biography was written. The 1950 film brought the king and queen to its premiere. She loved two countries, and she committed to a single cause of freedom. She signed on personally for the uh, fight in France, knowing what it was going to happen to her, what could happen to her. She and the others broke barriers, smashed taboos, and altered the course of history. Today, the CIA is directed by a woman, Gina Hospel, since May 1918. She has appointed women to top directorates, and these women today have antecedents, whether they knew it or not. And the many French women who, con who contributed to this effort, their deeds were largely ignored. After the war, when de Gaulle marched into Paris decla uh, declaring Paris liberated, he largely downplayed the uh, assistance of the al other allies. And he managed to maintain the, fic the fiction that uh, Vichy France was an aberration and the rest of France had been nothing but resistors. So everyone who was a resistor was hailed and glorified, except the women. Uh, no one really could understand, uh, thought that they could have done much to it. Uh, so that role was really downplayed. Historically, women's labor often goes uncounted, and uh, this was no exception to it. Uh, and yet they were the forgers, the couriers, 
the quartermasters because feeding spies counted for something as well. Uh, they were the ones who kept the flame of French life and the French spirit alive. Um, the Churchillian uh, story of arming and paying for and financing the French resistance was largely downplayed too. Uh, the French Republic had never faded. It was always right there according to de Gaulle and all of the de Gaullistas who were running France at that time. And so the story was France freed herself. And these women uh, were mostly without bitterness because of that because after all it was uh, it was war and uh, they were doing it for love of country as much as anything. But as memos are unsealed and uh, records are kept better, we are finding out more and more, and these books were certainly worth it. And as the French would say, c'était la guerre. After all, it was war. Thank you. Well, wasn't that great? Uh, now, next week we're gonna have a real treat. Uh, I don't believe Mary Robertson has ever been in Rajabian before, you're going to find that she's a compelling speaker and it's a fabulous topic. Uh, it's about the man who was maybe our greatest American, although he never held the presidency, Benjamin Franklin. It's Ben Franklin, the founding father who winked at history. So see you next week.